so we've had we've had to say Black Lives Matter, unfortunately, because we live in a culture and a society that has um, given us many reasons to feel like they don't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering from you, um, if we're at the tail end of generations of black Americans who have felt like their lives don't have um, the proper amount of value, like what do you think have been some of the effects of that on us psychologically or emotionally? Absolutely. Ooh, great question, Mike. Um, one of the first protests we did for Black Lives Matter was in 2013 on July 15th at, on Rodeo Drive. It's one of the first times that we didn't take a protest into our neighborhood because we know what's happening on Crenshaw and King. We know what's happening in Watts and Compton. So we decided to go to Beverly Hills, the epicenter of whiteness. And I remember, you know, all the cops were out, helicopters were out. We were on the steps of Rodeo Drive. People were eating food and drinking wine. And I had this moment where I asked everybody, stop, drink, put your wine glasses down, put your forks down and take a moment to grieve with us mm. because you don't, you don't have to experience this every single day. The helicopter, this is the helicopter that roams our streets and our communities every single day. Yep. Imagine the psychological impact that has on feeling hunted because that's what we feel. We feel hunted because that's what's happening. Ahmaud Arbery was hunted. Breonna Taylor was hunted. Mm -hmm. um, Ezel Ford was hunted. Riddell Jones was hunted. These are not people who are going into a fight with law enforcement. They're usually running away from. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if you're running away from something, something has to be running towards you Ooh. with a gun. That's called being hunted. So I feel like we have to we have to actually paint that picture mm -hmm. for a lot of America to understand the kind of grief and rage that comes from us. What does it take for a child in Minneapolis to burn down a police precinct? Mm -hmm. Why would that be the target? Why would a police precinct be the target? That is the, the, the ultimate symbol for so many of us for the last 401 years. That is the symbol of hatred, humiliation, abuse, and death, law enforcement. They can't paint it any other picture because that's what we've lived. Right. You can't take our life experience from us. My first, my, my, my nephew's first experience with cops, he was 11 years old, running home in the alleyway, guns pulled out of him, 11 years old. So something that does something to your, your mind, your spirit, your body, and it does something generationally that doesn't stop with me. It doesn't stop with my child. That's generational trauma. And we mm -hmm. have to be, I think the, the reason why BLM was really um, uh, the voice around healing justice, we made it popular. That's not our phrase. Um, that phrase comes from a brilliant black woman, but we made it popular because so much of the history of black movements have been to deny the pain and the trauma mm. and to only focus on the politics, sometimes focus on art and culture. Like the Panthers did a brilliant job at art and culture with Emory Douglas, mm -hmm. but we wanted to elevate the conversation around healing and that it was okay to talk about depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and any other shit because this place has been so bad to us. Right. It is a normal human response to have all of those things. And so how do we heal from that? And how do we do it as a collective? And how do we do it outside often of the medical industrial complex? That's fantastic. You know, you remind me of when I was in, um, you remind me of, of, of uh, when the events of Ferguson happened. Um, I was at my home and I walked down to my local coffee bean and there was a friend of mine there, Brandon Johnson, the homie Brandon Johnson, and he was <laughs> visibly upset. I walked in, I was also upset, and we were talking, and he, he specifically said, we are being hunted. Hmm. We are being hunted. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that, to take that on as like someone is coming after, because I remember schools with metal detectors Mm -hmm. And that the psychological trick, I remember when I went to a school and there was a metal detector and then suddenly went to a different school and there was no metal detector. Absolutely. Uh, can you guess what the populations of these student bodies Absolutely. were? So it's like that's a that's a thing that comes on us. But yeah, so I was sitting there with with my my friend Brandon and I, I had realized for myself, even I had internalized. These deaths as par for the course, yes. you know, my first reaction was that's what they do to us mm -hmm. and it took me until i want to say freddie gray when i was like 
I, I, went, I, threw, I literally threw up. I was just kind of like, yeah. I can't take this anymore. And I'd, yep. I'd realized in some sort of way how complacent, in a sense, I had been, which is why, again, I want to bring it back to self-care because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, for me, has been very helpful. Talking about mental health, talking about depression and all of these things because you know, I remember Richard Pryor used to have a joke like, we need therapy. He was saying this in the 70s. After what we've been through, yeah. he's like, we need some therapy. Yeah. And so I want to expand a little bit on that. Um, but yeah, I, just, I, was, I guess I just want to expand a little bit on that. Sure. I mean, you know, I think the so much of the conversation it, um, it circles in the conversation of like politics. This is a political issue, right? But this is so much more. This is a planetary issue. Um, this is a planetary fight. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are fighting for the survival of humanity when we fight for the survival of Black people. And I think we need to remind people that as well, paint a picture of what has happened to us and what's been not just on this, um, not just in this country. Um, I argue there's a, this, there is a, a, a global pandemic of anti-Black racism. Yes. And it doesn't just impact Black people in America. I've been to um, lots of countries. And obviously, the first thing I'm doing is talking to Black people. I'm usually going to go talk to Black people. And whether it's Australia or London or Amsterdam or Scotland or the continent every or Brazil, Black people are saying thank you for giving us the opportunity and the voice to lift up what is happening to us again. I don't like the term self-care. It is to eat, pray, love. I choose, <laughs> I choose to use the term collective care because collective care, okay. collective care actually pushes and challenges all of our institutions to not just say, hey, must be having a hard day today. Go ahead and take a self-care day. Um, self-care days don't stop white supremacy. Mm -hmm. What stops white supremacy is changing your systems. So collective care means that if I'm going to work, my and work environment understands the impact of anti-Black racism and how that shows up inside both the workplace and the world, and that there is already mechanisms in place that will think about how I am, my care, my needs, mm. and all the other Black people who work there's needs. I think that's really important that there's a place and space inside of institutions that are challenging the ways in which anti-Black racism shows up and how we're treated. There's so many especially young black folks in entertainment that I've spoken to who are like, my job doesn't get it. They don't understand. And they're, they're the same corporations that are plastering Black Lives Matter on their screens that are giving Black Lives Matter donations. And yet in the very environment, they're not actually treating their black staff, black creatives well. And so that's also a really important conversation.